so what we're going to do to today and probably most of our time is to go back and to talk about some of the distinctives of Proverbs, some of the nature of the book of Proverbs. And as we do that, um, hopefully it will kind of complete our look at the, at the collection of writings that we call the Proverbs. And then, of course, we'll move on to Job. This material that we're looking at right now in Proverbs will not be on a quiz. It will not uh, appear as quiz questions later on. So our, th our second quiz is going to be entirely over our material on Job. Now, as we get into uh, just some of the distinctives of the book, uh, you'll notice on my notes, that is the notes uh, page three, beginning with Proverbs, this is another example like the collection of Psalms we have in our scriptures that are really a variety of authors. Uh, we, do, we do know that Solomon wrote many or most of these. And so this, this literature largely comes out of the Solomon period. But we also know that there was a whole gathering or court of wise men or sages that became officially a part of the teaching leadership of Israel. And that would be a section, I'm looking here at my notes on page three, a section um, of the book referring to the wise men. Proverbs 22 to 24 would be an example of that. These, for the most part, are coming out of Solomon's period, but they could also appear as wisdom writings from other individuals. In most cases, not identified. But we do have a couple of wisdom writers identified that are very interesting ones, and I mentioned those by name. Agur has a section in Proverbs chapter 30, and Lemuel uh, has a section in Proverbs 31. We essentially know nothing about these two individuals, so we really don't have any background about Agur and Lemuel. But I wanted to, um, one, one of my favorite passages in Proverbs is the prayer of Agur. And I gave you last week, I think, an article that I had written on that prayer, because I, I find this to be one of, the, one of the great statements of wisdom in the book about life. And uh, so if you have your Bible there, turn to Proverbs chapter 30. This is, this is a great chapter. It has a lot of uh, different numerical sayings in it, and uh, so a lot of very creative type of writing. But in chapter 30, well, beginning in verse 7, Augur says, Two things I ask of you, deny them not to me before I die. Number one, remove from me falsehood and lying. That's a great request. Let me live a life of honesty, a life of integrity. Uh, take away from me the temptation continually to misrepresent things in life. Second prayer, and this is the part that's often emphasized, give me neither poverty nor riches. And the, um, my translation has here, but feed me with the food that is needful for me. I actually like the NIV on this. Give me neither poverty or riches. Well, maybe this is an NIV, but give to me my daily bread. Uh, the, the, the point in that last passage is give to me what I need only. Give me neither poverty, the extremes of poverty or riches, but give to me what I need. And then he goes on, and this is the part that is so insightful for our lives, I think. He goes on to say, um, lest I be full and deny you. So what he's talking about is obviously, what would happen to me, Lord, if you gave me everything, if you gave me riches? Well, I might then deny you and be full of myself and say, well, who is the Lord anyway? So one temptation in life, if we have too much and are not able to handle that, is we forget about God. We begin trusting in ourselves. We begin coasting. And so Augur's prayer is, Lord, don't give me so much wealth that I lose sight of who you are and that I lose sight of my relationship with you. But the other side of it is important too. He says, 
do not give me poverty, or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Um, his prayer also is, don't put me in a state of destitute, a life of destitution so that, I, that I'm going to be so desperate that I'm tempted to steal. What I love about this prayer is it's such a balanced view of life. And, and as I said in the um, article I gave to you um, last week that this is a much more satisfying prayer to me than the prayer of Jabez. The prayer of Jabez, I think, is really taken out of context in many things that are written about it. And a number of years ago, it became very famous, I think, because people really liked the idea of demanding that God give them a lot of material things. The prayer of Jabez became a prosperity theology type of prayer. Now, I am not saying that everyone used it that way. In fact, um, is it Wilkerson who wrote the book on prayer of Jabez? Uh, Wilkerson, I don't think, had the intent when he wrote about prayer of Jabez. Um, David Wilkerson, I guess it is. He didn't have the intent of it being a prosperity theology type of prayer. But it certainly was taken that way. And you'll find the responses to so many people were this audacity, this um, pride of demanding of God that if somehow we name it and claim it, if we demand of God that he give us all the things that we're, we want in life, our wants rather than our needs, then God will honor our, our faith. He will honor our prayer. I, I just find that to be such a inferior prayer to the prayer of Augur. Augur is so humble in the way he views life. And he said, Lord, I'm recognizing my weaknesses. And if you give me too much, I might be tempted to be prideful and forget about you. If you give me too little, I might be tempted to, to steal and to find other ways to meet my needs. So, Lord, give me neither poverty nor riches. I love the balance of that. And that was why I wrote that article is, I really think that's a better prayer for us as Christians to pray. Let it up to God, who has a lot more wisdom than we do, to know what we can handle. And so when we pray, not to demand of God that he give us this or that, but Lord, whatever you know is best for me, whatever your will is, I think it's a, it's a great balance, it's a great prayer. And you might find that useful in, in, uh, in teaching and encouraging encouraging people. Well, I want to do a few things with Proverbs today uh, using PowerPoint and talking about uh, one passage particularly and then some of the aspects of Proverbs. Uh, first of all, if you have your Bible again there, turn to Proverbs chapter 1. Most would view this as not just an introduction to the first chapter, but really an intentional introduction to the book. And what we see in Proverbs chapter 1 is a great use of a number of words that have to do with wisdom. And in fact, I like to use Proverbs 1 verses 1 to 7 to really find, to really define what wisdom is all about. There are a number of um, synonymous parallelisms and those expressions use many of the words for wisdom. Uh, first verse, actually verse 2 after the introduction, of Solomon and son of David and so forth. Verse two says, to know, I'm reading out of the ESV, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight. Well, first of all, wisdom, the word wisdom here, the Hebrew word musar is, um, is a great, one of the great collection of words about what, about the insight that God gives to us. And the meaning of the word, as I've given you on the PowerPoint slide here, is moral discernment between good and evil um, in all areas of life, both the practical and the spiritual, but just the ability to have a discernment. This is a widely used book, mus a widely used word, I should say. Muzar is used 47 times in the book. In most cases, it's translated with the English word wisdom. Um, a discernment. Some of you would translate that in your ministries to being a good counselor so that you can listen to people sort through the things that they're sharing with you. 
there's a, an accompanying word here that I think is really helpful also. And again, remember, we're, we're using words here that involve parallelisms. The idea of insight, to understand words of insight. Uh, the NAS, NASB uses the translation here, understanding. This is also a widely used word. You can see 53 times in the book of Proverbs this word is used. The, the word bina is the Hebrew word for it. Um, again, very similar in meaning, an, an ability, an intellectual ability to, to discern between right and wrong, between truth and error. Whether you like it or not, if you commit yourself in any way to ministry, a vocational ministry, a, a, a volunteer position, people will seek you out and ask for your advice about things. Uh, sometimes and often many of us feel very inadequate to be in that position. We have our own baggage. We haven't always made good decisions ourselves. And yet if you're in any way put in that role of a, as a Christian leader, you're going to find that people will, will ask you. And it is an awesome, and I'm saying this in the scary way, it is an awesome responsibility to be put in that position to be asked by people to give them counsel about things. Um, I have never viewed myself as a gifted counselor. I know others who have far more gifts in this area than I do, but I found myself as a pastor, and still do to this day even as a professor, but I found myself often as a pastor in the role of being invited into a situation. Sometimes it was premarital counseling, Sometimes it was marriages that were struggling and uh, being asked to be a listener and to hear what people were saying. And by the way, that is, we'll get to the subject of counseling when we get to Job's book. But one of the best things you can remember about being a counselor is to be a good listener. You're not always needed to give a lot of advice. You probably are going to be asked to give some. But the best thing you can do for, for folks is to listen to them they rarely find people who really listen to them. That's a key part of being a good, good counselor. But I found myself in a variety of marriage counseling situations. I remember one that, oh, this still sticks in my mind because it was so scary. Um, a couple came to me, they were engaged, and actually I had tentatively agreed to marry them, though I wanted to get to know them better. And in our first session, we were talking through some issues in their life, and I could tell they had issues. We were talking through some issues as a, as a couple, and right there in front of me, they broke off the engagement. It was all over. <laughs> they walked out of the room and the engagement never happened. I mean, the marriage never happened. And I was still taken back by this because I don't remember saying anything, to be honest. But I did ask some questions, and I guess the questions brought out issues that they had not really talked about. And those issues were very important ones. And um, afterward, I thought to myself, that was a powerful thing. <laughs> that here, here, my involvement in this couple, with this couple, changed the whole course of both of their lives. And I think you know what I'm talking about. When you're in ministry, you will find that even a, even a word that you say at times that you don't think of as a big deal will sometimes be taken by someone as very, very important. People are listening. Sometimes they're desperate, and they're really listening to any insight and wisdom that you might have. And so when we come to this a passage like this, that God wants to give us this moral discernment, this ability to discern between right and wrong, and then place us in the role of a counselor, this is an awesome responsibility because our words often will influence the choices and the direction of people's lives. And we in some ways have that responsibility then, not that we're going to make all their choices for them, but we're certainly going to give them some insight in, in those choices. Um, maybe it's why I, <laughs> I was always hesitant to get deeply involved in marital counseling just because I did not consider myself as gifted as, other, as others were. I'm, I'm curious if any of you in your ministries um, 
are very, very much involved in counseling people. Situation. Zach, what, what, how, do you, how are you called on to do that? In a pastor's role? Okay, forgot that, you're right. That's what you do, yeah. Yeah, I find, and this has been on my part learning by trial and error, but I find the asking of good questions is maybe the most important thing that you can do. Um, in the file analysis, something you say that is, not, that is in the form of a, of a conclusion about their life may impact them, but generally they have to reach their conclusions. Their will has to be involved in it. And so the, one of the best things you can do is just to ask leading questions that really take them into the, into the important things. I'm curious more, um, not as much to the subject here, but within the Kaiser system, are you limited on how much you can bring a religious point of view into this? Absolutely. Preaching, you know, it's, it's just kind of weaving in and out of their, you know, perspective. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Well, God bless you in that ministry. That, you know, in a hospice kind of ministry, too, there's a, it's a, it's, it's a stage in life where there's it's a lot of serious stuff happening there. And people are more open, more teachable. Um, yeah, those are, those are challenging things to do to kind of... But I think you feel. I think you felt the same way. Of um, your words can mean a lot. So very, very carefully choosing those words. Howard, did you have your hand up? Uh, counseling. What what kind of counseling do you do? In what setting? Just at the church. So mm -hmm. I guess in a couple of cases, send a text this and pray for them and ask questions. Yeah, they send the tougher cases to you. Yeah. Yeah. Is this a volunteer kind of role on your part? Yeah, I just found that I really enjoyed it. Good. Good. You know, what Howard is saying about discovering that you enjoy something, and then if others affirm what you're feeling and that maybe there's a gift here, that, that, is, that is a tremendous step in ministry to discover those areas. I, I really believe an affirmation of our spiritual gifts is the joy in doing something. Even though they might be difficult things, which counseling sometimes is a very difficult thing, we enjoy it. Um, a weird twist of that for me as a pastor, to be honest with you, I hated doing counseling. Um, I did it because I had to, but I, it was not something I, that brought me a great fulfillment. But something I enjoyed doing and this is going to sound real morose here, real weird, but I enjoy doing funerals for people. And I think the reason I did is just what I was saying to Zach a moment ago. It was a time in people's lives when they were faced with some really important issues and they couldn't avoid them. A loved one has died. And so what I enjoyed was not the funeral per se or the the ceremony, although I didn't mind doing that, but it was the ministry with the people, that you really get to come alongside people, both encouraging them and also being available to them. And I found myself doing a lot of funerals, even outside of our church. 
Um, and I was really glad I discovered, I don't do as many anymore because I'm not in a pastoral role as much anymore, but it doesn't bother me to step in to that kind of crisis situation. And um, so I think, I, I think what you're discovering about yourself is really good. Uh, giftedness, what brings you joy, and so forth. I saw someone else, uh, who else is involved in counseling people? <laughs> I know already what you're gonna say. <laughs> Caitlin, what do you, who do you counsel? Whom do you counsel? Oh. Yeah, I was saying you're, you're in charge of women's ministry, so that's a bigger. Right. Right. Very much so, yeah. I really believe if we could tie together the New Testament idea of spiritual gifts, that there is a giftedness in this area that some of us have beyond others. And that is a discernment, uh, a level of wisdom that goes beyond, because it's a gift from God, that goes beyond maybe the average Christian's abilities. And you find yourself, as Howard has said, being involved in situations that bring you fulfillment and joy doing this. And it's because of that giftedness that is there. And then in other situations like myself, um, not really feeling <laughs> like this is something I enjoy doing or want to do. Um, well, the, the interesting, um, I think interesting words here. I want to remind you of something uh, that is a reality for all of us, and this is just going back to a slide that I had earlier in our discussion of wisdom, that sin has distorted people's view of life and their wisdom. So that when we talk about this idea of discernment, discerning between right and wrong, we would love everyone to possess this ability, and if you're made in the image of God, and if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, there's a level to which you do possess this ability, but never forget that it is tainted with sin, and there's a distortion that has happened in our thinking processes. This was the point of this slide earlier, that the effects of sin on the human race have limited our abilities, and so that's why we find people in such messes in their lives. Um, they are not living wisely. They are making poor choices, sometimes self-destructive choices. And it takes someone in a counseling role to step in and, and to guide them. Uh, in verse 4, there's another interesting word here. It is the word that is translated prudent, prudence. And I think it's both in the NIV and the ESV. It's the Hebrew word horma. It's, um, it's a word, the translation uh, in some, of, uh, some translations says prudence to the simple. It's important for us to define who the simple are because the word simple means something different in English usage. Simple can be taken by some as they just, they just don't have enough intellectual ability uh, to, even retarded, um, how would you say it? They're dwarfed emotionally. Simple is a negative connotation, but not in, not in scripture. When you read about the simple in Proverbs, it is simply those who are younger and naive and inexperienced. They have not yet experienced enough life to know how to put things into context. The simple, are those who are naive. And of course here we're often talking about young people, youth who have not yet gone through life, but then when we become teenagers, we think we know everything, right? We are now little adults, and we now are now thinking, I've, I've got this all wired, I know how to do this. And um, my wife and I have raised two teenagers, and our teenagers were pretty typical, though they weren't rebellious. They really thought, by the time they reached about age 13, mom and dad do not understand life anymore. <laughs> and so there's just a time through 
those teenage years when the simple or the naive really think that they know how to live life, but unfortunately they don't. You can also be, you can, this would be true of you if you are fairly sheltered and inexperienced even as a young adult and have simply not had a lot of relationships with others. So this is, this is simply uh, not in a negative way, but it is speaking of someone who needs help from others, who needs help from wisdom. And as teenagers, this is often the case to give discretion. Uh, when our daughters were going through those years, as I said, they weren't re overly rebellious, but they definitely felt mom and dad, the, the rules that we made for them were not fair. And um, they felt that if they could just have a chance to make their own rules, it would be a lot, life would be a lot better. Well, it would have been better in one way. But what we tried to explain through those years is that they don't fully understand life yet. And there are, there are situations that they could get in that at that point, we still wanted them to be protected. But there's this fine line as a parent, what you're trying to do, and by the way, Proverbs a lot of Proverbs are written from the point of view of a parent helping his child to understand life better. There's a lot of those experiences that you want to let your child have independence and to learn on their own. And so a lot of advice is given in this area to give prudence to the simple. How to learn from, from other people's failures and successes. By learning wisdom, maybe not, not even from our parents, by learning wisdom, we can learn the easy way not to make the same mistakes. In a moment, we'll see uh, a couple of areas that prudence is given to the simple. Uh, Proverbs does emphasize especially two areas, I think, of giving advice and guidance to those who are younger. Interesting thing about wisdom, and this takes us down to verse five, is we never get too old, but that we still need wisdom. We never stop learning, we never stop growing. And so verse five says that let the wise, in other words, those who have already achieved a lot of wisdom, let the wise hear and increase in their learning. And the one who understands or the one who is wise already, let him obtain guidance. There is always great value in going to others. Um, through the years, we, uh, my wife and I were involved in, in marriage seminars. And um, some of them were better than others. Some of them were very effective. Others didn't seem to really connect with the, the people at them. But marriage seminars are uh, very commonly participated in by a lot of couples. And one of, one of, the, one of my memories of of one marriage seminar was a couple who, and I'm getting, I'm getting nearer these ages now, so it even means more to me now, but a couple who had, the husband had just retired, retired from his job. He was 70 years old, and I think his wife was about mid-60s. And um, as we started out the marriage seminar, um, folks went around the room sharing, well, why did you come to this seminar? Most of us were really young couples. My wife and I were, probably in our first 10 years of marriage at that time. Well, we've come here, and others said the same thing. We've come here because we're just trying to figure this thing out. We're, we're trying to navigate through marriage. It's not easy, and so we want to find out from others how they handle things, and obvious reasons why when you're younger, why you need to go to a marriage seminar. But here was this couple, 65 and age 70, at a marriage seminar, and I really loved what they said. They were very humble about it. They said, you know, we feel like we've got a good marriage and we've been at this for many, many years, but we still have a lot to learn. And they were sharing how going to this marriage seminar, they wanted to uh, ask some questions or at least be begin thinking about a new stage in their life, which was going to be the retirement years. And now, now the husband was going to be home with his wife all the time. He said, that's going to be a big adjustment. <laughs> I've got to spend a lot more hours with my wife. Um, and he said it in a joking way, but it, it really is true. When you go through different stages of life, there are, 
there are different kinds of wisdom that you need and different ways of applying that. So we never get too old, but that we need to increase in our learning, to increase in our wisdom. And the claim of Proverbs, the introduction of Proverbs, is that it gives us something for everybody. It gives us something for the, uh, the naive and the young. It gives us something for those who are further along in their learning. Okay, another, um, another slide here relating to, these are a little, a little bit disjointed, but kind of different aspects of, of Proverbs, of what we're looking at when we look at Proverbs. This is a, a slide that helps to unpack the question, what is a proverb? Mashal is the Hebrew word for this. The meaning of the word simply means to lay something alongside of, a comparison of some sort. And so even from the word itself, from the mashal, we get the idea that we learn wisdom at times by illustrations, by comparing um, various, various things out of different realms of life that help us to understand wisdom. Um, three basic forms of the proverb in the book of Proverbs. One is, and this would, be the, this would be the one you would normally think of when you hear the word proverb, the short saying. And I've put on your um, PowerPoint slide there just a number of definitions of proverbs that I've run across through the years that I really have liked. And um, I think I have them all on your handout too, but I, I really have liked these because they kind of cap, they capture the essence of the mashal, of what was involved in the mashal and the Hebrew idea of a proverb. Short sentences drawn from long experience. Great way to say it. They're brief in most cases, but don't let the brevity lead you to think that there's not a lot here. There's a lot of years of experience packed into a short sentence. Uh, C.H. Spurgeon once said, three things which go to make up a proverb. Shortness, sense, and salt. Now, I think I know what the first two mean, but I'm not sure what Spurgeon meant by the last one. Um, shortness, obviously brevity is a common form of the mashal. Sense, there's common sense here that it, it obviously gives us guidance in life in a good direction. <coughs> Uh, what might you think, why would he have said salt? Shortness sense salt. Season. Season. Which would in a proverb mean what about it? Season, oh, seasoned meaning coming from experience? Yeah, coming from many mm -hmm. Hmm, that's, a, that's an interesting one. That, that would not have been the first thing I jumped to, but that is the idea of a seasoning coming from many, many experiences of the past. What do we use salt for? Well, seasoning, flavor. Some have suggested salt here may mean there's a pungency about it. Um, many proverbs have a little element of surprise. As we'll see in a moment, they sometimes have an element of humor. And some have suggested that. I, I don't know what Spurgeon meant. I, I, I think it, it probably has something to do with, it could be the seasoning from years of experience. It could be also just this idea of a, of a punch, a pungency to the proverb. Uh, Elmsley uh, wrote about the Proverbs Compressed experience, that's an interesting one. Compressed experience, it's very much similar to the other ideas here. Estes in our textbook says, a brief pungent maxim crystallizing experience. I like that actually. It's pungent and maybe, maybe that's what Spurgeon meant by salt. It's brief, but it crystallizes a lot of experience. Um, the boiled down summation of many generations of experience in living. That probably says it all. Um, 
Remember, wisdom in any culture did not have to be in Israel. Wisdom in any culture comes through observations about life. What works and what doesn't work. And when, once we observe what works and what doesn't work, then we ultimately um, re, we preserve those for another generation so that a new generation can learn the easy way rather than the hard way, at least if they're teachable. If they're teachable, they don't have to go through the crisis of a failure to learn what it might take to fail or what, it, what would be the cause of failure. So one form of the mashal are the short sayings. That would be the most common that we're used to in the book of Proverbs. There are also Proverbs, sections of Proverbs, that are called the discourses, admonitions included in those. And we most often find this form of the proverb introduced by the expression, my son. I think many of you recognize immediately after the first seven verses of Proverbs, we enter into the first of several of a number of sections of Proverbs. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching. Now, just based on that, those words I, I read, what, what would be your impression of how these were used? The my son passages now. What would be a likely use of the discourses? In parenting, in the home. The home is the setting, and parents are using these to teach children. It was a way of giving them instruction as to um, how to have a relationship with God and how to practically live that out. There is a further development of this, and I think this actually appears on another slide, that shows that in cultures around Israel, and in Israel included, sometimes my son referred to a disciple. And the one who is teaching my son is not a physical father, but would be a spiritual leader of some sort, like a sage or a wise man who has gathered disciples. Jesus obviously models this in the gathering of his disciples. But that these sayings maybe, maybe began in the home and began as teaching of parent to child, but ultimately they evolved into a societal type of role where there would be a gifted teacher who would be teaching those who were under his, his influence. I think, I think that's a, a, both of those are likely true. It's not an either or, but it's a both and. We also find in some of the, song, uh, some of the Proverbs numerical sayings, and I skipped over those earlier, but the same chapter as the prayer of Augur is one of the uh, ones where we have m many of the numerical sayings. Uh, these are sayings that use an X comma X plus one formula to, uh, to make a point. Um, just going to read one of the shorter ones here. Under three, this is verse 21, under three things the earth trembles. Under four, it cannot bear up. A slave when he becomes a king a fool when he is filled with food, an unloved woman when she gets a husband, and a maidservant when she displaces her, her mistress. Now, in each of the numerical sayings, you have a number stated and then x plus one. There are three, yea, there are four things. The most famous of these is there are six things that the Lord hates Yea, seven. Does anyone remember where that is? There are six things that the Lord hates. Yea, seven. And now that I've asked you, I've forgotten myself. <laughs> um, somebody look that up. It's the most famous of the numerical sayings. By the way, it's not in Proverbs, I don't believe. It's, um, can't remember now where that is. What, while you're looking that up, what is the point of... <laughs> What is the point of x, x plus 1, do you think? Could be emphasis. And 
And um, what would be th th emphasized? All of them? Or the last one? There are three things the Lord hates. He ate four. It is Proverbs. Proverbs 6. Why was I thinking it was elsewhere? I don't rem remember. I haven't looked at that for a while. Yeah, there it is. 616. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. <coughs> could be, it could be for emphasis. What would be another reason for having numerical sayings? Uh, to, uh, in what way, to what do you mean? Yeah. Uh, enter, enter, it's entertaining and it is a unique way of expressing a list of things that are important. Another th suggestion has been made maybe for memory purposes. Uh, I, I don't think most would agree that he doesn't say there are X things, and, oh I forgot one and then X plus one. That isn't the point. But rather the X and the X plus one actually helps us to remember how many there are. And the list would be more of, a re of remembering, perhaps remembering things that are being emphasized about wisdom. It's just a technique of writing wisdom, not, nothing more than that. Um, I want to say a little bit here about the um, function of Proverbs. We've talked about different aspects here. Bullock, in, in his book on the wisdom book, the wisdom writings, Bullock refers to the function of Proverbs in this way, that it is shaping men and women into socially and religiously useful members of society. So if you look at Israel's culture, this was not strictly religious teaching, about a relationship with God. Certainly there's a lot of connection here with our relationship with God. But it was taking Torah, taking the truth of their relationship with God now and, and bringing it into the very practical, everyday, societal type of relationships and teaching about those. How to be socially and religiously useful members of society, that society would work well. And Bullock goes on to say, I wanted to highlight um, what I think are some really helpful points here. He goes on to say that the Proverbs serve several different functions. He names three of them. Uh, they were entertaining. And maybe this is tied together with the numerical sayings that we just used. There are different techniques that are used in the writing of the Proverbs that make them very entertaining. And at times, humor is used to grab our attention. This entertainment helps to make them memorable. So we will think about them and we will remember them. Um, here's some examples that, that are given of the idea of entertainment. Humor. Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman without discretion. <laughs> I don't, do you know what that means? I'm not sure. <laughs> well, obviously, obviously a a gold ring has no place in a pig's snout. So there's a contradiction there. If you, and you just visualize that and you start laughing about it to see this pig in the pigsty with a gold ring in its nose. Well, what he goes on to say that a beautiful woman, physical beauty, who doesn't have discretion is another contradiction. That the true beauty of this woman needs to go beyond just the physical beauty um, so there's surprising elements here. There are humorous elements here. I like a lot of the Proverbs about the sluggard, the lazy person. They're, some of them are, are humorous. Here's a, a funny one. The sluggard buries his hand in his dish and will not even bring it back to his mouth. The picture here is of somebody eating. And, and of course, he's eating with his fingers. He's eating with his hands. And he is so lazy that he doesn't even have the energy to bring his hand back up to feed himself. He buries his hand in his dish and maybe he falls asleep or whatever it is. 
Uh, the sluggard is a humorous character, but when we really look at what is said about him, it's not really so funny if we know people who are lazy in life, who don't get any, anywhere in life. It's a very serious thing, but the, the, the proverbs often about the sluggard have that humor to them that get us laughing about this, this individual. So entertainment, there are entertaining aspects about the Proverbs. Uh, there seem to be some Proverbs, as I, would, I would say this only relates to a few, that actually have had probably had a legal role within the life of Israel. And I didn't put, I didn't put in these parentheses parallel passages, but both of these are examples where if you were to go to Deuteronomy, to the civil law, of what happened between people within Israel. You would find exact parallels to both of these Proverbs. And many believe that the civil law, that is Torah, was put into the form of Proverbs to help remind people, help them to remember things. This one, of course, has to do with cheating in your business dealings. Unequal weights and unequal measures are both alike an abomination to the Lord. Um, all business transactions would have been done with scales and weights. And when you're buying and selling, you're even, even the currency, even the money is weighed. And so to cheat, to cheat in your business dealings would be to have a scale that was set up so that you would take money away from people or you might put your thumb on the edge of the scale so that it didn't work properly. Um, an abomination to the Lord. God hates cheating. He hates dishonesty in, in, our, in our business transactions. It's really sad. Um, I guess it's just a sign of the times, but in many circles today, even in f positions of authority, there's nothing wrong with cheating or lying as long as you get away with it. Now, if you get caught and you break the law and something happens by way of a penalty, then that's a bad thing. But if you get away with it, it's okay. It just shows that you're really shrewd and you're really good at what you do. Very sad uh, to see that situational ethics become a part of, of business thinking. The other, the other one has to do with um, land, and land was very valuable. Families had boundary markers or boundary stones. In fact, when you travel to Israel today, you can actually still find examples of this, of a boundary stone that would have marked the corner of a property. Usually boundary stones would be at the corner of a property. Don't move the ancient boundary landmark or ancient boundary stone that your fathers have set. In other words, cheating once again. Don't find creative ways to take things that were already set and to change them. Um, as I said in Deuteronomy, we find these exact examples. And then there were many, many um, in Proverbs, there are many, many places where we find ethical instruction in general. The, the simple or the naive believes everything, but the prudent give, gives thought to his steps. To be young is to be very vulnerable. And as we grow, as we become wiser, then we we're able to think things through. We're not so quick to make decisions. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. And favor is better than silver or gold. I, I, I think we see many of those, uh, the valuing of, of our reputation, the valuing of our good name and so forth. So these are some examples of functions of Proverbs. Now just to finish things off here, um, these are totally unrelated ideas, but I wanted to uh, bring them together before we lose, before we leave Proverbs. So we've talked a lot about the use of parallelisms, and I find it interesting in the book of Proverbs, which is divided, I think you know, into intentional sections, some of which have to do with authorship. Solomon's the author of a section, and then there'll be the wise men or the sages who'll be the author. But notice that parallelisms are used more in a more focused way in certain kinds of proverbs. For example, the section 10 to 15 
is, is the greatest example of Proverbs about the wicked and the righteous. We're not surprised to find that the antithetic parallelism here is used almost entirely through uh, in, a, in a dominant kind of way. 156 verses are contrasts. So over and over, the righteous but the wicked, we find these contrasts. Then when we move into another section immediately following, which would be more general observations about life, you find a lot of comparisons, um, in this case synonymous parallelisms, that are going to compare life, illustrations of life to different things and help us to understand a little bit better. So it's an interesting use of the, um, of the parallelism idea as we move through the different kind of wisdom literature. Some of this I've already touched on a little bit earlier. Um, just talked about this a moment ago. My son would have probably been a term that evolved from parental advice, ultimately becoming the teaching of a wisdom teacher for his students, and likely was used in both settings. Here's um, an interesting point as you survey the advice that is given especially advice in this case to the naive, to the simple, to the young. Two areas of advice, or two, area, two um, subject areas, which by the way are great topical studies in Proverbs, to, um, to survey through the book of Proverbs and find the teachings on these two subjects is I think a really instructive study. One of the pieces of advice given to my son, beware of the friends that you make. Beware of the wrong friends that you might choose. Uh, beware of the people that you hang out with. Obviously the in intent of that is they're going to influence who you become, who you are. And then the second area, especially I think focused in Proverbs 5 through 7, would be the warnings to young men especially, because the, uh, the uh, illustration is of a young man, the warnings to young men about sexual temptation. And you may remember some of the most famous passages are in chapters five through seven. Um, chapter seven is, is likely the most graphic of all in the sense of, of showing the great danger of falling prey, of becoming the prey of sexual temptation. And um, this young man is pictured as walking along the street. He intentionally goes there because the dusk is following, it's getting evening. But he seems to know that he's going to meet up with this young wife and she is married, her husband is away on a journey. And so this, this is a passage starting out very, in, in a very tantalizing way, in a very enticing kind of way. And this young man is invited into her house, and don't worry, my husband's gone away for a month. And the whole story is pictured, and then we come to the end of the story, and her, her, the enjoyment of that sexual temptation is going to be the, way, the slide to hell. And literally, her house is pictured as a trap door and the bottom is going to drop out and one is, the young man is going to, his life will be ruined, he will be sliding into hell. The warnings about sexual temptation and the warnings about choosing of wrong friends are, seem to be two areas of emphasis for teaching the naive. And um, I think we would all agree that well, this would be true for all of us, but true f especially for the impressionable years, that this is still the best advice that you could give. These are, these are two areas of either good or bad decisions that all of us make in those years of being naive and being, uh, of, of needing to have guidance. Uh, the kinds of friends we choose and the, the standards that we have for our sexual lives are two huge areas of decision. And it's interesting as we go back into the ancient wisdom of Proverbs, things weren't different then. The advice, same advice is being given uh, in the My Son passages 
in both of these areas. So some powerful teaching and the themes that come out of this are really quite contemporary for us as well. Okay, well that, uh, those are just some areas I wanted to go back and pick up and touch on that we, uh, before we leave Proverbs, talk about some of the usefulness of the book. I look forward uh, down the road a ways in a few weeks toward the end of the semester um, for many of you getting papers on Proverbs. I don't know if any of you have chosen your topic yet, but that's a great thing to think about. Um, in fact, I want to remind you that we're not meeting next week. I think you all know that. It's Tory week here at Biola, so all classes on Wednesday through Friday are canceled. Um, there is a great Tory schedule of speakers. If you have an interest in that, that is on the Biola website and can give you the things that are happening. But I suspect that many of you are going to say, you know, I've got a lot to do, and I'm going to use this, use this time to catch up a little bit. Um, my, we have a paper coming up. In fact, I think it's due right after we come back from our break. So probably your first priority is given to the, the paper on creation and God as creator. I would, unless you have some specific questions on that, I would just encourage you, read carefully what I've written in the instructions on that, because I think you'll find in those instructions what I'm looking for in the paper, what I'm asking you to do. But if you do have further questions about it, right now would be fine, or we can also um, dialogue by email if you run into questions about this subject. Uh, if you've not investigated this subject, it is one that is easily overlooked in the wisdom writings. We don't think of creation much outside of Genesis 1 and 2. But yet, once you begin to investigate that theme in the wisdom books, and I'm speaking especially of Job and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, uh, but beyond that even, you're allowed to use some passages out of Psalms on this theme. What you will find is that the theme of God as our creator and how creation, how his creation fits in to other teaching is it becomes a pretty powerful thing. So I want to um, answer any questions that you have right now or if you'd like to write to me with any questions, that would be fine. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.